Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A few weeks ago, some of the students at Chiang Mai International School did the play The Importance of Being Earnest. It's a very famous play, and the most famous part of it is when they discover that the main male protagonist was found in a handbag and when he was abandoned as a baby. And Lady Bracknell says, A handbag? And that's the most famous line from that play. If you know it, you'll understand it. The whole point of the play is that the female lead has decided she must marry somebody whose name is Ernest. She loves the name, and that's the most important thing. So it doesn't matter what the man is like, as long as he has the right name, then she will marry him. And so it becomes great confusion of who the real earnest person is. Well, I could almost have entitled my sermon, The Importance of Being Sexist. <coughs> that sounds a strange thing to say. The importance of being sexist. But to some Christians, it seems now, they have made that the very centre of their faith. Quite recently I was watching a clip on the television from an English commentator who's quite fundamentalist, and she said, We are made male or female. It's God's truth. It's the first premise of being made in God's image. The first premise of Christianity. To her the most important thing, the first thing of Christianity is being male or female the importance of being sexist. For her, it's the first order thing. It's the most important, or one of the most important things of the gospel. And to change anything, if you're transgender, to change is rebelling against God. As a woman, to refuse to submit to your husband is rebelling against God. For a woman to preach or to speak in church is rebelling against God. It has become the most important thing, far more important than all the other things which are important, like loving one another and caring for one another. Well, why am I talking about this this morning? How does that relate to our Bible readings that were given to us today in the lecture room? Well, it came to my mind because I was looking at the three readings which we have. The first one is from Proverbs talking about wisdom. The second from Colossians, talking about who Christ is as the image of the invisible God. And then the third reading is from John, that very famous prologue where it begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning, and it continues onwards. Now when I started to look at these passages, I thought, well, that's quite interesting, because in the Old Testament, it's talking about wisdom. And for many people, that is seen as the idea of Christ, of the Word. For the idea of the Word in the New Testament, the Logos, is very linked with the idea of wisdom in the Old Testament, which occurs throughout the whole of the wisdom literature. And this verse from Proverbs 8 is just part of that. But one of the interesting things is that in Proverbs, it talks about wisdom and says she. It says, does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? And so wisdom, it seems, is female, at least in the Old Testament. And that set me thinking, is this the correct translation, or is it just one of those things that we say, well, she is a beautiful ship, and it doesn't really mean we think a ship is female. So I looked at the Hebrew. Yes, the word for wisdom is a feminine word in Hebrew. But then the word for understanding, which comes in the second line, is a masculine word. So it's not really just dependent upon the word. But the word is a feminine word and throughout wisdom literature, like the Song of Songs and like um, many of the parts of the Old Testament, wisdom is personified and is described as she. But then I look to our New Testament readings, to Colossians, where it says, He is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things in heaven were created, and so on. And in the New Testament, well, it's clear that it says he, when it's talking about Christ. And it emphasizes it, for it goes on again. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that in him all things might have their place. For in him all the fullness of God dwells, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. So the emphasis seems to be on him and he and himself. And then I looked at the Greek, and that word does not mean he at all. It's a word which can mean he, or it can mean she, or it can mean it, or it can mean them. It doesn't have any gender at all. The gender is not important in the passage. What is important is who Christ is, not whether he's male or female. And the same is true in our John reading. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him was not one thing made that was made. And it goes on, Him, Him. But that word again, it's not a gender word, it just means in that person. It could be applied to a man or a woman. Now, I'm not saying that Christ was a woman, and I'm not saying Christ was intersect or anything else, but the point is, his gender is not important. It's not even, even a subsidiary factor. The point is that Christ has come to us as a human being. The NRSV, which is this translation, the New Revised Standard Version that we read our scriptures in, has made a great effort to use non-gendered language. So instead of just saying brethren, it says brothers and sisters, so that people are aware that it applies to both men and women. And yet even in the NRSV, if we read it wrongly, we can be thinking, he, he, himself, him, it's emphasizing his gender, when it's not. In the Greek, it can mean, as I said, he or she or it or they, even when it talks about John the Baptist and it says there was a man who came from God. Actually in the Greek it just means there was someone who came from God. The only place where the actual word man, meaning male, is used in this passage is when it talks about being born not of the will of man or the flesh. Because then it's talking about procreation and the father being the one who brings the child into the world. Or fathers the child. But gender is not important. But if it's not important, why am I spending all this time talking about it? Why does it even matter? Well, I think it does matter because people use that interpretation to mean many things. They will say no to gay marriage because God is male and the church is female, and therefore the relationship between the two has to be between a male and a female, so all marriage must be like that. They'll say no to trans people because they'll say, you can't change because God has made you male or female, and it's the most important thing. They'll say no to women in leadership because they'll say, no, God is male and a female is lesser, and so therefore, they won't say it's lesser, but that's what they're thinking, and therefore cannot represent God or speak God's word. Now, it's not actually that important because these people believe these things. In a way, that's up to them. But it's important because other people start to believe that is what the Bible is teaching. So even people who maybe take a different view still think that is what the Bible is teaching and they just reject the teaching of the Bible, thinking, well, I don't agree with it. But they still accept that's what it's saying. I've seen TV debates where a fundamentalist will say, well, the Bible says this, and an atheist will say, Yes, the Bible says this, and we'll agree, but then think it's wrong and then reject the Bible. And then people start to think, well, Christianity must be wrong because it's wrong on this, so it must be wrong on other things too. I've seen people on television, I saw one just the other day, <coughs> saying marriage, Jesus said that marriage is between one man and one woman. Jesus never said that. These are people who've studied the Bible in great depth and should know. Jesus never, ever said that. I 
and yet it's repeated again and again until people believe it. It's rather like the idea of false news. If you repeat something often enough, people will believe what you're saying. Many people are rejecting coming to Jesus because they think they can't accept some of the teaching that they think is part of it. And so it's very important. It's very important because Jesus' message is good news for all. That he came for all. That he lived his life for all. That he died for all. Whether black or white or male or female, that is not the point. The point is that Christ is for all, in all, and comes to all people. It's strange that sometimes I've seen a depiction of Christ in art as, as a black man on the cross. And I thought, well, that's good because it reminds us that Christ is for all people, not just the white, blue-eyed people that we often see Christ depicted as. And also it makes us think that the suffering that black people often encounter with racism and so on, and that is part of the suffering that maybe Christ took onto himself on the cross. And I've, I've had no problem with that. But at other times I've seen a picture of a female Christ, and I thought, well, that's not good because that's wrong. That, Jesus wasn't female, he was male. So it's, it's a confusion. But actually Jesus, in the same way, wasn't black. But depicting Christ in a slightly different way can make us realize that Christ is for all. If we can accept the black Christ on the cross, why can't we accept the female one? Why is that a step too far? Gender is how we express ourselves. But it's not how God expresses God's self. God is beyond that. And God, we are all made in the image of God, male or female or anything else. We, each one of us, human beings, are made in God's image. It's good, I think, that in Thai and many other Asian languages you don't have this problem because the word for he or she isn't quite the same. It's just them and they. So it doesn't have the same problem. The reason I'm speaking about this is because, not just on this issue, on many other issues, it's very important how we read the Bible, how we read the scriptures and how we understand them. That we just don't take on board what other people have told us and assume that is what it's saying. Sometimes we have to look beyond the text in English and look at the Greek and the Hebrew. And if you can't read Greek and Hebrew, I can't really read Greek and Hebrew, but if there's so many resources where you can click on the word and find the Greek and Hebrew and then read what it means. And so you can do more research yourself. So in today's reading, it's not really saying that wisdom is feminine or masculine. It's not really saying that the word is female or male in that sense. What it's saying is that God made the world and he made it along with Christ who was there at the beginning of creation and saying that God loves each person, that God came into the world as the Word made flesh, as God with us, so that, as the text says, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth, and we've seen his glory, the glory as the Father's only Son, all who received him who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. That is why Christ came. So that all who believed in his name were given the power to become children of God and become into that relationship with the God who created all things. 